Hello and welcome. I'm Katherine Hamilton from NASA's Office of Communications. This is the pre-launch briefing for Northrop Grumman's 14th Commercial Resupply Services flight to the International Space Station. The company's Antares rocket is poised to lift off from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport pad, Launch Pad 0A from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility here in Virginia. Antares will send the company's Cygnus spacecraft, loaded with nearly 8,000 pounds of supplies and hardware and research, to the International Space Station to support Expeditions 63 and 64. Northrop Grumman is currently targeting a launch window for Thursday, October 1st at 9.38 p.m. Eastern. Here with us are several experts that will give us an update on the mission. Joining us from Johnson Space Center in Houston, we have Greg Dorth, manager for the International Space Station Program External Integration Office, Heidi Paris, Assistant Heidi Program Paris. Scientist, International Space Station Program, Science, Space Office. Station Program Science Office. Here with me in the room, our Frank DeMauro, Vice President and General Manager for Tactical Space Systems at Northrop Grumman. Kurt Eberly, Director for Launch Vehicles at Northrop Grumman. And Shannon Fitzpatrick, Chief of the Wallops Flight Facility Range and Mission Management Office. We'll be, begin with opening comments from our speakers and then we'll take questions. For those following online, you can ask questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll begin with Greg at Johnson. Greg? Good afternoon. It is great to be here to be a part of the NG-14 pre-launch press briefing. We are very excited to uh, receive Cygnus uh, this next Sunday. Um, we were really looking forward to a launch tomorrow and arrival on Saturday of Cygnus to the ISS, but Mother Nature has chosen to uh, uh, not cooperate with us on this launch as it does with a lot of our launches. So it's great though that uh, we are ha have the opportunity on Thursday for the Antares launch and again arrival on Sunday of Cygnus to the ISS. As the 14th flight to the ISS, the Cygnus has been a workhorse for us in bringing cargo and removing cargo from the, the ISS as trash. We, uh, it's brought up tens and tens of tons of uh, metric tons of uh, cargo and uh, it's key is, is a lot of the research, crew supplies, critical spares that we need on ISS in order to continue operations. But one of the things that is really important is the fact that it removes a significant amount of trash and cargo from the ISS. Stowage is always a concern on the ISS. It's, it's critical for us to ensure that the crew can be as effective and as efficient as possible in the operations. And uh, similar to our homes, if we uh, continue to just bring things home and we don't ever clean house, I think we all have a, a closet or two that uh, make it pretty challenging for us to find anything in. So again, um, we thank Northrop Grumman for its partnership through the Commercial Resupply Services contract and for uh, the um, significant amount of cargo, three and a half metric tons that will be brought to the ISS with over a third of that being research. I also wanted to give a quick update on some recent activities as well as ongoing activities that are, that are coming up on the ISS. Chris Cassidy, Anatoly, and Ivan are doing an outstanding job of during the increment 63 period, especially during this three-person crew. They're, they're maximizing the amount of research we can accomplish while still maintaining the ISS. And we also are still really, really benefiting from the very, very successful Demo 2 SpaceX Crew Dragon mission where Doug and Bob were arrived at the ISS and they were there for 60 plus days on ISS and worked tirelessly to finish the uh, certification and demonstration activities for the uh, Crew Dragon as well as they provided us with a significant amount of crew time to be able to help maintain the station and do some research, as well as other critical activities. One of those critical activities was for us to be able to conduct four EVAs. Chris and Bob went outside the ISS four times doing spacewalks at the end of June and through July. And their primary purpose was to complete our upgrade of our solar array battery systems. Our S6 solar array wing was upgraded from the nickel hydrogen batteries to the lithium ion batteries and this is the final solar array wing that needed to be upgraded. They did an outstanding job during the EVAs and uh, as a result of their uh, efficiency uh, during the EVAs we actually got a lot of get-ahead tasks completed. 
One of the, uh, one of the other significant activities that they performed during the EVAs was to outfit the Node 3 to receive a uh, commercial airlock, which has been developed by Nanorax. We're looking forward to its arrival to the ISS. It's a commercial um, uh, endeavor done by Nanorax to provide the ability to um, take um, research external to the ISS through this airlock. Uh, it arrives again on SpaceX 21 towards the end of this year. August 18th was the uh, end of the HCV-9 mission on ISS. It was unberthed and then returned and burned up via our JAXA um, colleagues and our partnership with them. HTV-9 was actually the last HTV that will come to the ISS. Our JAXA partners are um, working on a new cargo vehicle called the HTV-X. They're in the process of developing and building that cargo vehicle. It will uh, take over providing cargo to the ISS, as well as JAXA's intent for it to be used in LEO and other cislunar missions. So I personally want to congratulate JAXA on a phenomenally successful HTV program, and we are very much looking forward to the arrival of HTVX. Let's see, looking forward, NG-14 arrival, uh, or excuse me, Cygnus's arrival from NG-14 on Sunday marks the beginning of a very busy vehicle traffic uh, month for us on ISS. We will either have uh, an arriving or departing vehicle, four of them, over the three weeks after NG-14 arrives. On October 14th, the 63 Soyuz crew will arrive, beginning increment 64, bringing up Sergei Rizhkov, Sergei Kuzverkov, and Kate Rubens. And um, we are very much looking forward to their arrival. They'll do a, uh, a handover period with Chris, Anatoly, and Ivan of about seven days. And on the 21st of October, 62 Soyuz will depart ISS, bringing Chris, Anatoly, and Ivan home. And then lastly, within that six, uh, excuse me, three week period, um, our USCV Crew-1, SpaceX first post-certification mission is scheduled to uh, launch on October 23rd and arrive the ISS on the uh, October 24th. And so we're very much excited and looking forward to, uh, to Mike, Victor, uh, Shannon and um, Suichi arriving. So getting back to NG-14, which is why we're here today, again, I just want to uh, um, tell you how excited we are for its arrival. And um, uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Heidi. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here today. Excited to, to talk about the science with you today. Um, so we are now just about to come up to um, 20 years of continuous human presence on the ISS in low Earth orbit. And I want to take just a few minutes to talk about what um, 20 years of continuous research looks like from the science standpoint. Um, and also we'll talk a little bit about uh, the science that's coming up on NG14 later this week. Um, so by the numbers, uh, 20 continuous years of research on the International Space Station equates to um, right around 3,000 different scientific studies. And that represents the work of, um, of over 4,200 scientists from 108 countries all around the world. Um, and this research is really very diverse. Um, it, it really spans um, you know, most of the, uh, of the scientific disciplines that you would think of when you think about scientific research. Um, on the biology side, we have spent a lot of time in the last 20 years researching diseases, um, trying to understand how they work at a fundamental level, which is something that we can do very well on the International Space Station due to the microgravity environment there. Um, we've been researching diseases uh, including cancer, um, Alzheimer's, uh, we've been researching Parkinson's, um, heart disease, and, and a number of others. Um, and, and sometimes those, uh, that research leads to development of new drugs, um, which is the case with, uh, with one of the investigations that was studying Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And there's now a, a clinical trials ongoing for, for a drug um, to help combat that disease. We're also doing a lot of research on the biology side into um, to the human body and human health, really, really trying to understand how to keep ourselves healthy, especially as we age, um, things like bone and muscle health and, and eye health, that kind of thing. 
Um, we're also doing a lot of research on the physical sciences side, looking at um, how to create um, better and stronger materials, how to um, use the combustion research that we're doing to create and design better, um, um, cleaner fuel, um, fuel combustion engines. Um, we're looking at uh, colloids research and looking at how to create longer lasting liquid and gel products that, um, that we probably use in our everyday lives and, and don't really think a lot about the science behind them. Um, ISS is actually also a, a fantastic external research platform and we've been doing a lot of investigations over the last 20 years into um, both the universe, studying the universe and, and how it works and why it works that way and then also um, pointing our sensors down to the earth and looking at um, studying the earth's ecosystem as a whole which is uh, very difficult to do from, from the ground. Um, in terms of technology, we've done um, lots of technology testing, hundreds and hundreds of different um, technologies, and a lot of those are being tested out to help us explore um, to the moon and then explore further onto Mars after that. But a lot of them are also um, really looking to expand the, the boundaries of our current technology capabilities um, and, and position us better in the future to improve our everyday lives. Now, we've also had the opportunity to see a lot of the technologies that we had to develop to be able to live and work on the ISS, to see those repurposed into other, um, other applications that help us on Earth. Um, one example of that is uh, the water purification system on the ISS that has been repurposed to now provide clean drinking water all over the world. Um, another example is, um, is an air scrubber that had to be designed so that we could grow crops on board the ISS and that has been repurposed to be um, a very effective air purifier that's used in places like doctor's offices, um, operating rooms, grocery stores, that kind of thing. And um, we've also spent a lot of time in the last 20 years really trying to invest in the next generation of scientists and engineers. Um, you know, we, we have investigations, we have scientific experiments that range from, um, you know, providing elementary school students with seeds that have flown on a previous uh, mission and, and having them grow those seeds and compare those to seeds that haven't flown, um, you know, on one end of the spectrum. And the other end, we have students that are sequencing DNA on the ISS and are um, developing algorithms to fly the remote control robots on board the International Space Station. Um, so that's really just a very, very small snapshot of all of the science that we've been doing in the last 20 years. Um, if you're interested in more information, I would highly encourage you to go to our website, um, www.nasa.gov backslash ISS science, uh, ISS dash science um, for some more information on those. Um, and now to, um, to kind of shift over to talking about the science that's coming up on this Cygnus vehicle. Um, lots of great stuff coming up that we're very excited for. The, the hardware that's coming up is going to support over 40 different scientific studies. Um, and I'll talk about just a few of those now. Um, we have a, an investigation called Onco Selectors coming up um, that's going to be looking at some um, leukemia drugs to understand um, which ones are the safest and, and the most effective. Um, we have uh, one called One Step Gene Sampling Tool that's going to come up um, to uh, have, a, have a better, faster way to, um, to do genetic analysis without having to destroy the, uh, the sample, the specimen, which is, which is usually what you have to do in order to get that genetic analysis. Um, we have a Plant Habitat O2 coming up. This one is um, it's expanding our crop growing capabilities on the ISS. We're adding um, radishes to our space salad. Um, and that's also going to be looking at, um, at uh, how, how different growth and watering and lighting conditions um, impact the growth of those plants. Um, let's see, we have a couple investigations coming up to study a special uh, blend of fiber optics called ZBLAN. Um, this, this blend of fiber optics um, is, is very beneficial because it has a very low signal attenuation and it's also uh, multispectral. But it's very hard to produce on the Earth. Um, which makes it a great candidate for us to look at in the International Space Station. Um, so those investigations are called fiber optic production and space fibers. Um, we have a, a furnace facility coming up um, that's going to be studying material science. Actually has a whole slew of investigations that are going to process in, in this facility, um, looking at how to um, improve our processes to create materials that are better, um, stronger, and more lightweight. Um, and then we also have several investigations coming up that are looking at, um, at uh, uh, how to um, better um, reuse and recycle our waste products on board, which is very important um, on the ISS and also for future space exploration. Um, those investigations are the GEM water recovery system and um, ammonia electrooxidation. 
So lots of great stuff coming up on the Cygnus vehicle. We're, we're very excited to, to get started on the science. Um, if you'd like to, um, to get some, some more real-time updates and to understand what, uh, what things are going on in the research world on the ISS, a great place to do that is um, on Twitter at ISS underscore research. And with that, I will hand it over to Frank. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Heidi. And on behalf of Northrop Grumman, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today and learning more about the NG-14 mission. Uh, with several humans aboard the station at any given time, keeping the ISS stocked with critical supplies is really an essential mission. And the Cygnus and Antares teams, uh, with our partners NASA and Virginia Space, have remained focused on completing our mission while working to ensure the safety of everyone involved. Our strong partnerships with the Antares team, the NASA team, Commonwealth of Virginia, and Mars were critical in developing new operating procedures that have kept our team safe while still allowing them to work in these unprecedented times. Uh, but before I go into the details about this mission, I'd like to share a short video about both Cygnus and Antares uh, with footage shot from previous missions. Okay, well that never gets old. Uh, both Kurt and I are very proud of our teams for the incredible work they do to support these missions. Each mission is always unique uh, and brings different challenges and the team really works great together uh, pulling these missions together, operating them successfully and allowing us to deliver for our NASA customer. On this particular mission, Cygnus will carry nearly 8,000 pounds of critical cargo to the ISS. Uh, we're all, we'll also once again host the spacecraft fire experiment known as SAFIRE. Uh, this uh, Cygnus provides a unique environment where we can safely study fire in microgravity in a pressurized environment. Uh, the SAFIRE experiment is uh, developed and built by NASA Glenn Research Center, and this will be the fifth time that we carry the SAFIRE experiment on Cygnus. And we're also going to host another Northrop Grumman uh, payload called SharkSat. Uh, SharkSat is a prototype payload that will be mounted on the outside of Cygnus and will collect performance of this new technology in low Earth orbit. Um, and with the NG-14 missions, we continue to demonstrate that Cygnus 
has evolved from being just a cargo delivery and disposal spacecraft to a full scientific laboratory and will continue to use uh, Cygnus' unique capabilities to provide additional uh, capabilities to NASA and our commercial customers. On this mission, for example, we'll once again host experiments inside the cargo module. So while we're attached to the ISS, the crew will conduct experiments inside of Cygnus as opposed to removing them and bringing them into the ISS. It's part of the Extend the Lab program. And uh, we're excited to be able to do that with the spacecraft. Uh, and these capabilities, along with our experience in human spaceflight, I really position us perfectly to support NASA's goal of uh, landing the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024, and then eventually returning in a sustainable way. Uh, currently, we're working on the Habitat and Logistics Outpost, the HALO module, which will be positioned as part of the Lunar Gateway, and it'll provide a place for astronauts to stay uh, either before or after uh, their trips to the lunar surface. And we're also very proud to be part of the national team, led by Blue Origin, currently working on the next generation human landing system. Uh, both missions can benefit from the experience we've gained using, using Cygnus on or around the ISS. And while we are hard at work on those NASA Artemis programs, we remain committed to the efforts in low Earth orbit as well. We know there is great value in maintaining the presence on the International Space Station and the ability to conduct uh, experiments and tests with new technologies that will support not only Artemis but other uh, deep space missions is critical. So we are uh, ready to continue to perform well for our NASA customer and perform the critical roles necessary to keep the station operating at full capacity. Finally, uh, it is the company's tradition to name each Cygnus after an individual who has played a pivotal role in human spaceflight. And this mission is named for astronaut Kalpna Chavla. Kalpna was uh, selected as an astronaut in 1995. She flew her first flight in 1996 on STS-87. And sadly, in 2003, Kalpna and her crew members tragically lost their lives during mission STS-107 when Columbia did not survive its return to Earth. Uh, Kalpna was selected in honor of her prominent place, place in history as the first woman of Indian descent to go into space and someone who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the continuation of the human exploration of space. Her final research conducted on board Columbia helped us understand astronaut health and safety during space flight and paved the way for humans to live and work on, in space and on the International Space Station. And we are incredibly honored to name this spacecraft the SS Kalpna Chavla. So as always, we're excited to execute another uh, Cygnus mission and support both NASA and our commercial partners. Uh, as this is a night launch, uh, I do encourage everyone on the East Coast to look to the sky at uh, 9.38 p.m. on the 1st, Eastern Daylight Time, and see if you can catch a glimpse of the Antares rocket as it propels the SS Kalpnachala towards the International Space Station. A launch on Thursday night uh, will result in a rendezvous uh, early Sunday morning with the International Space Station, and of course, we're always excited to, to get to the ISS and deliver the valuable cargo. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt Eberle uh, to talk more about the Antares program. Kurt. Thank you, Frank. Well, I'm really excited to be here with all of you to talk about the next launch of uh, Antares and Cygnus. Uh, first, looking back at the last launch, which was NG-13, uh, just this past uh, first half of the year, uh, that was fully successful. We've reviewed all the data, and, uh, and everything looked like the performance was right on the money. So, uh, so an excellent mission. So now on to NG-14. So NG-13 was the second launch of the 230 plus configuration which we developed specifically for the CRS-2 contract to provide more capability to NASA. Uh, so NG-14 will be the third mission. And uh, those 230 plus upgrades include more mass to orbit, a 24 hour final cargo load. We saw in the video uh, how we do that with our mobile clean room that we bring uh, out to the pad and put over the front of the vehicle while we're, we're horizontal on the ramp there. And then also we offer cargo mass flexibility where, where NASA can really vary the amount of cargo uh, that they're going to pack in the Cygnus uh, right up to that final cargo load. With regards to the, the NG-14 integration flow, it's been very smooth uh, with few issues. Uh, so credit goes to the experienced integration and test team that we have resident here at Wallops. Can't say enough good about uh, how well they do. Uh, Frank mentioned the, uh, the restrictions that we put in place to keep our workforce safe during the pandemic. Uh, that's, that's made their job a little harder, but it's, uh, they've, they've uh, followed the rules and done a great job allowing us to get all the work done that we need to get done, uh, even with these restrictions. So credit to them. I'd also like to thank 
Our partners, Dale Nash and his Virginia Space team who operate and maintain the spaceport and Launchpad 0A. Peter Dell, Dave Pierce, Shannon, and the rest of the Wallops Range team for the partnership with us uh, that helps us prepare and, and uh, get ready for these launches. I'd like to thank the FAA who, who uh, plays an important role in licensing uh, these commercial launches. We also get great support from the local Wallops area uh, with restaurants and hotels and all the logistics support. So we really appreciate uh, the community here at the Wallops area. Just a note about preparations for NG-14. Last Thursday we had our dress rehearsal with Cygnus and Antares, the range, the spaceport, uh, working through green cards and allowing our launch conductors to, uh, to torture the, uh, the launch team with all sorts of scenarios and uh, they guaranteed that they were going to make it harder than the actual launch day and I hope that that's the case. On Saturday we rolled out to the pad, we rotated the vehicle to vertical, we did an important test on Sunday, that's our combined systems test, which checks all the interfaces between the rocket and the launch pad and the range. We also had the launch readiness review yesterday and all parties are ready to support the launch. Today we went back down horizontal and we're moving the mobile clean room that you saw in the video over the front of the vehicle. We will remove the pop top off the fairing and allow Cygnus to get access to the hatch uh, for the final cargo load that's upcoming. Uh, because of the weather delay, and we're gonna, we're gonna delay until Thursday, so we have a couple down days, that's good for crew rest. We'll be doing some battery charging and some monitoring. And Wednesday evening is really when, uh, when we'll get back into it with the final cargo load at 24 hours. It'll start around 8.35 p.m. and NASA will bring the cargo in and Cygnus team will load it into the Cygnus cargo module. Uh, and then they'll clo do all closeouts over the night. And then around 6.30 a.m. we'll start our, clo our closeouts on the Antares, put the pop top back on uh, and get everything ready to go vertical. We go vertical around 8.30. We connect commodity lines and do a quick leak check. The team, the launch team will report to their consoles uh, in the control rooms around 4 p.m. for a five hour countdown that will start at 4.38 p.m. Our five minute launch window opens at 9.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and yes, it should be uh, a, an interesting uh, viewing on a night launch. Uh, hopefully the skies will be clear and it's a pretty good weather forecast uh, for Thursday. So fueling of the liquid first stage will start about one and a half hours prior to launch. Once we do lift off, it's about a nine minute ride to orbit followed by Cygnus separation. Uh, it's been a smooth integration flow and all systems are going in Taris at this time, so thank you all for being here. And we're looking forward to a good launch on Thursday. And now I'd like to turn it over to Shannon, Chief of the Range. Thank you, Kurt. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for your interest in the NG-14 mission. Wallops is very excited to be here supporting yet another Cygnus resupply mission to the International Space Station, specifically this NG-14 mission. We are very proud of the entire launch team, not only our Wallops team, but also our partners teams as well, and getting to this point of launch readiness. I'm very happy to report that currently all range systems are green. We have completed all of our tests successfully. We have locked in the range configuration and all range clearances are in place. So this mission has had some challenges that we haven't always had on some of our previous missions. So Mother Nature has played a big part with this mission. Wallops operates a tracking station in Bermuda that's used to support the Antares launches. And over the course of the last month, Bermuda has experienced not one, but two hurricanes. Hurricane Paulette went over the island as a Category 2, and then just this past week, Hurricane Teddy just brushed the edge of the island, producing tropical storm conditions on Bermuda. The Wallops crew rode out the storm in a secure hotel, and I'm also happy to report that after further inspection and testing, the Bermuda tracking station has had n experienced no adverse effects from the storms, and we are fully functional and ready to support the mission. Now, as far as Mother Nature here locally, obviously we haven't had the best support either with the launch having to be pushed out to Thursday, but we're going to cross our fingers that we have better luck coming up for the rest of the forecast later in the week. So now let's take a look at our extended forecast to see what we expect to experience as we go into our launch window starting Thursday. So on Thursday, our, weather, our Wallops Weather Office is predicting a 30% probability of violation. And what this means is that 30% of the time we would experience a violation of our launch commit criteria, which would prevent us from launching. But 30% isn't all that bad. Going into Friday, the conditions do deteriorate slightly showing a 40% prob 
probability of violation, but then Saturday our conditions start to improve with only a 10% chance of violation. So again, we're going to cross our fingers and hope that Mother Nature's on our side leading into the end of this week. So in summary, the Wallops range is green, we are ready to support, and we look forward to a beautiful night launch this Thursday evening of the NG-14 mission. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you. We'll now take questions. My colleague Jamie Atkins here in the room is taking questions from reporters via email and from social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, Jamie, we'll take our first question, please. Hello. Um, we have a question from Amal on Facebook. He asks, what is the payload capacity of the Cygnus spacecraft? Sure. Uh, thanks for that question. So Cygnus carries uh, about 3,729 kilograms of cargo inside the cargo module. And then we can also carry some cargo outside of the module uh, bolted on. So it's, a, it's and, and most of that, that 3,729 car, kilograms of cargo, uh, about 8,000 pounds, a little bit more, uh, is, is what's called pressurized cargo. So that's what goes into the module. It's closed. It's a fully pressurized environment. And that's about as much cargo as we can also take away from the space station uh, as NASA and the astronauts fill it up with cargo they want to get rid of. And off the space station, we take that cargo away. Thank you. We'll take our next question, please. Um, another question from Facebook from Adam H. What is the payload this time, and how long will it take to arrive? Uh, well, I, so the, the payload on board Cygnus is really a, a combination of the science experiments that, that Heidi talked about. I, I mentioned the Sapphire experiment that we will uh, we'll launch for NASA that will actually stay on the spacecraft and actually have that experiment conducted after we leave the space station. Uh, we are also carrying food for the astronauts. We're also carrying spare parts for the, uh, for the space station itself. Uh, so it's really a, a mix of, of about 30% science experiments, and the rest of it is uh, either supplies for the crew or for the space station. Uh, how long will it take to get to the ISS? So how many days on any particular day really depend on where the ISS is when we launch the spacecraft? So if we launch on Thursday night, it'll take a little over two days to get there. So we will uh, so we'll launch, launch Thursday night, and we'll get there the early part of Sunday morning uh, on the East Coast. All right. Next question, please. Um, again, from Facebook, from Eric, he asks, is there a viewing area? So I can answer that question. So because of the, the current situation we are in with COVID, we normally would have a viewing area at our, at our visitor center here by Wallops. However, the, viewing, the visitor center is closed for this launch. However, we highly encourage everyone to view the launch on our social media, and we will have live streaming occurring about 30 minutes prior to launch time on Thursday evening, starting at 9 o'clock on NASA TV. Thank you. We'll take the next question, please. Okay, this is one's from Alex on Twitter. The question's from Mr. Eberly. Is there an environmental or weather constraint that could impair your ability to keep the mobile clean room attached to the horizontal Antares rocket for several days? Can, you can they both stay horizontal for an extended rain delay? Yeah, good question. Uh, we've actually proven that we can do that on some past missions. We've had significant rain in this configuration. Uh, we do have a seal around the fairing. I think you saw that in the, the video that we saw where uh, there's, a, there's a round opening and we, we move the clean room over the front of Cygnus and then we do have a seal that's inflated to uh, press against the, uh, the fairing uh, surface. Uh, it's not perfect. We sometimes do get a little uh, rain intrusion um, based on the direction of the rain and how hard it's going. So, so, uh, uh, but we, so we do put some covers over the opening uh, when it's really raining hard as well. Uh, but we have a lot of air conditioning blowing in there. We keep the temperature uh, very good. The humidity is controlled. Uh, so overall, we've been very successful in, in having a really controlled environment inside that uh, mobile clean room. And, and yes, we are expecting quite a bit of rain uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. So, so we are taking those measures now to prepare for that. Thank you. We'll take another question, please. OK, I have two here um, from Jeff Fro Faust of Space News. Um, are there any updates on the ISS leak investigation that required the crew to spend another weekend isolated in the Zavada module? 
Um, and then we have a question for Frank and Kurt Eberly. Could you provide examples of how COVID-related precautions affected spacecraft and launch vehicle processing? All right, we'll go to Johnson for the first. Yes, uh, great question also. So regarding the leak, um, the crew did spend three days in August, August 21st through 24th, isolated in the Russian segment so that we could do some um, assessments of and isolation of the U.S. segment and see if there was any leaks on the U.S. segment as well as a portion of the Russian segment. Um, after the uh, three days, there was no um, indication of where the leak was coming from. Uh, the teams evaluated the data and decided this past weekend to also repeat the tests with some slightly different configurations on both the U.S. segment as well as the Russian segment. And also we had Chris take a ultrasonic leak detector onto the Russian segment, which he could use to see if he could hear a leak uh, in the uh, area that he was, he and uh, the other crew members were in. Um, as of this morning, there was no uh, clear indication of where the leak is. The, the teams are still looking at the, uh, the data and evaluating it, and uh, we'll continue to uh, um, search for this uh, very, very small leak. I, I do want to say that the leak is, is not a safety of crew nor a safety of station issue. It's a very, very small leak. It's uh, an impact to our consumables, um, but we have planned for that where we can uh, address the leak as we continue the investigation. And I can, I can speak to the, to the second question about, uh, about the, the, uh, the changes to our operations with respect to, to COVID. Uh, you know, across north of Grumman, we have put in place a, a standard set of protocols. And the first thing we're doing is reviewing all of our operations with an eye towards keeping everyone socially distant from, from each other. Uh, nonetheless, there are certain operations, as you might expect, uh, in, in launch vehicle or spacecraft processing where folks need to be within six feet of each other. And so we've put in place a process where we review all of those operations in advance, and we look for ways to put people further apart. Uh, we challenge them to come up with ways to put in place uh, remote monitoring if, uh, if they were gonna look at a screen or something and, uh, and be able to put them in a different room and so on. And so we've been successful in reducing the number that do require people to be close to each other, but nonetheless, there are those, those operations, so ordinance installations, other things where you just really need to have two people uh, there. Uh, and then we put in place uh, uh, some extra PPE. We have uh, masks, of course, and then we have also have face shields uh, and other equipment that we use uh, to keep people safe. And, uh, and we've been very successful with that. We've been able to get all the work done that we need to get done and, and keep people safe uh, while we're doing it and be ready to launch here uh, on schedule. And one thing I would just like to add is the, uh, one of the things we'll do on the Cygnus mission operations team, and it's something we actually did for the, on NG-13, uh, which was at the ISS when, when the COVID uh, uh, precautions started to come into play, is we put some more tools in place so that team members, folks that are on our mission operations team, can actually monitor the spacecraft from home. We put in new secure uh, connections. We develop some new tools so they can actually see all the telemetry from their particular subsystems, uh, sort of do a, a kitchen table operations. And while there are certain parts of the mission, like launch, like rendezvous and, and departure, where uh, the team will come together in the Mission Operations Center. A lot of what we do is remote. And when we do have the team together in the Mission Operations Center, we take extra precautions, of course, with mask wearing, uh, sanitizing the area, uh, making sure there aren't any uh, non-essential personnel in the area, keeping folks away. There's a lot of interest in these missions, of course, and, uh, but, uh, but the team knows that the most important thing is running the mission successfully. And to do that, we need the, our Mission Operations team to be healthy and safe, and so we, we take all precautions necessary to operate the mission in a safe way. Thank you, we'll take our next question, please. Uh, this is from Gloria on Facebook. Um, how often should you send a resupply mission? Go to Johnson for that one, please. Yeah, so we, uh, we have a flight program within the space station program office, which we use to manage the, uh, the station activities uh, on an annual basis. And so we look at uh, 
the, uh, the number of consumables that are on board the space station. We track it on a regular basis. And based on it and the amount of research that we can accomplish based on the crew, we put together this flight program. And it details how many missions per year that we, we fly between our SpaceX uh, partners and Northrop Grumman and, uh, and our Russian colleagues as well. And so uh, I, there isn't a, any specific number that I can tell you that we fly each year. Um, it really just depends on the availability of the num number of crew on board, as well as the consumables use. Thank you. We'll take our next question, please. It's another question from social. It's Kristen on Twitter. She asked, what kind of process goes into choosing which research projects launch to the space station? Heidi, would you like to take that one, please? Sure. Yeah, and that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that uh, that people can get their research onto the International Space Station. Um, sometimes they come through the uh, the NASA system for, as, a, as a response to a NASA research announcement um, or an NRA. Sometimes they come through the ISS as a national lab. Um, so half of the ISS resources are dedicated to um, to uh, reaching out to sometimes non-traditional users that don't come from from the NASA side, including universities, um, uh, private businesses, that kind of thing. Um, and so they also put out announcements, calls for research. Um, but uh, but there's lots of different ways to get your research on the International Space Station. Um, if you're if you're interested in, in looking into how to do that, um, the website that I provided earlier is a great starting point. Again, that was www.nasa.gov backslash ISS-science. And on the left-hand side, there is um, a tab and, a, and an option for opportunities, and that will tell you all about how to get your research on the station. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, Anne on Facebook asks, will you show live experiments? Go to Johnson for that one, please. Sure. Um, so we're always, you know, we're, we're doing research um, essentially 24-7. There's always research going on on board the station. Um, and uh, a lot of times, um, you know, throughout the day on, uh, on NASA TV, there's different uh, broadcasts, and sometimes they show some of that research. Um, so definitely I, I would recommend um, taking a look at NASA TV and the NASA TV schedule um, and, and poking around to see what you might find. All right. I think we'll take about two more questions. We'll take the next one, please. All right, Philip on Twitter asks, will NG-14 Cygnus be performing an extended on-orbit stay after it departs the ISS? No, thanks for that question. Uh, so right now, we're not planning on any extended stay. Typically, we will, once we depart the ISS, we'll perform our secondary missions, and that will be, the, um, of course, the operating of the Sapphire 5 experiment. After we depart, uh, we will uh, operate, we will end, uh, release some CubeSats and, and operate the SharkSat payload uh, for, for a little while. And then we may do some experiments of the spacecraft uh, itself. We oftentimes will develop some experiments just to test out the systems and see how they react to different environments. But that all happens over a couple of week period. So our expectation is that after we leave the ISS, we'll be in orbit for another couple of weeks, maybe three, uh, and then we'll end the mission uh, after that. All right. And we'll take one more question, please. Okay, Angie on Facebook asks, what kind of food will you bring? We'll go to Houston for that one, please. Greg, I'll, I'll kick that over to you. Okay, all right, yeah, so the crew has a, uh, a, a menu uh, that they, uh, we have a standard menu that we provide the crew, um, but the crew also gets to select their, uh, their own preferences, if you will, um, and fly that up, so on Cygnus, we will have a, a, a large number of, of our standard food menu, which is items that, that you eat at home as well. And, uh, and then I'm not familiar with, with the on-orbit crew's preferences, whether they're um, <clears throat> more into vegetables or more into meat or what they've selected in their preference. But in general, we have a standard food menu that we, uh, that we provide to the crew. Thank you. That'll conclude the questions for today. A reminder that the launch of the Northrop Grumman and Terry's rocket in the Cygnus spacecraft is scheduled for Thursday, October 1st at 9.38 p.m. NASA television coverage will begin at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Until then, you can keep up to date about the status of this mission online at nasa.gov slash Northrop Grumman.
and follow the science aboard the space station at nasa.gov slash station. Thank you.